Good morning. As a uh, physical therapist that specializes in treating dizziness, I have worked with thousands of people over the years, and so many of them want to give up. Uh, they're frustrated. Uh, their feelings are, are just crushed. They're overwhelmed. They're exhausted. They feel terrible. Um, and so this morning, uh, I have a chance to share a message about not giving up. Our pastor, uh, his wife, has COVID. And so he actually is being quarantined. So I get to give a sermon tomorrow morning. And uh, I thought I would share it on YouTube uh, for those people who need a little extra hope, a little bit of extra um, strength to carry on and to push forward. Um, this, this message is uh, kind of geared toward a crowd oriented in the Christian faith. Um, that's, my, uh, that's my faith. And so um, if you're not a Christian or you don't share that same faith, uh, certainly don't mean to exclude you and welcome you to join in and listen. Um, would love to have you uh, participate with me today. So here we go. My effort at trying to be a preacher. We'll give it our best shot. Good morning. I would like to start by sharing one of my favorite quotes. This quote could fix a lot of your problems. It probably will not be what you would expect. <laughs> so before I share the quote, I just want to say that I know most of you came today hoping uh, and expecting to hear an awesome sermon from Rick. He has definitely spoiled us. Well, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that even though he is not here, like the godly pastor that we all know that he is, he shared his sermon notes with me. The bad news is, well, I'm the substitute teacher, or I mean the substitute speaker. So I will tell you what I tell my kids this morning, and that is, you're going to get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Back to my favorite quote. Now, this quote kind of goes against what I was taught in life. It's, it's one of my favorite quotes, and it has to do with expectations. <laughs> kind of appropriate for this morning. So here it is. Here's my favorite quote. Expectations are the enemy of serenity. It's very appropriate for this morning for you all. You all expected Rick. You got me, the substitute. So please let me share another one of my favorite quotes. If you expect nothing from somebody, you are never disappointed. <laughs> yep. When all else fails, lower those expectations. So if you all keep your expectations low this morning, at least you won't be disappointed when you walk out those doors. Speaking of walking out those doors, isn't it true that when you heard that Rick was not going to be here this morning, you saw me, the sub, and there was a slight sense like, I am out of here. How can I escape? That's okay. I understand. That is the power of unmet expectations. This morning, we are finishing the last sermon in Rick's sermon series of Faith That Sustains Us. Today, we will talk about not giving up on our faith. Expectations are powerful. Most of the time, met expectations often make us feel a sense of peace. Met expectations are predictable. They are what we planned or anticipated to happen. And even when things are bad, even when we expect something bad, like a loss to a football game, the fact that we knew it would happen doesn't make it so bad. On the flip side, sometimes expectations provide what we hoped for. They are sometimes a dream come true. They are all the feels. They are what we desired. Now, hate to bring this up, but think of the Cleveland Browns. Every year, we loyal fans expect a better season next year. Seasons come and seasons go. We get our hopes up and expectations high. We loyal fans stick around no matter what. We will sit in 30 degree, rainy, cold, weather and a and we will pack out a stadium with 60,000 plus fans even when playoff hopes are dim however 
There are Browns fans whose loyalty is based on expectations have, and those expectations go unmet. And some of the most zealous fans quickly give up, like this one. You can see this fan had some high expectations for the Cleveland Browns by buying a bus. Well, Browns lover who had this vision or expectation of a Super Bowl team, those dreams are now for sale. A true fan would hold on to that bus for one more year. Giving up is easy. We might commit to something in a moment of optimistic expectation. Then, when those expectations are not immediately met, and it is apparent that this new venture will require more work than anticipated, we give up. Hopes are dashed. Dreams crash. Prospects are trashed. And we just want to quit. Now, don't raise your hand. But have you ever given up? Maybe on a diet. You know, I personally have battled a three-year off and on diet. Or how about have you given up on, a, on an exercise program? You know that treadmill in the basement that's become an expensive clothes hanger? Maybe you quit a job shortly after starting it or dropped a class that became too difficult. I remember doing that in college. Maybe you discontinued a Bible reading plan or dropped out of a Bible study group you joined. Your expectations just weren't met. What makes us give up? More serious of a question. What makes people give up on their faith? Do unmet expectations impact our faith? When God meets our expectations in our lives, we feel our faith is strong. Now it's getting a little too heavy in here. So let's go back to the Browns fan selling the bus. <laughs> let's take that example just a little bit further. Fans who love the Browns based upon their record prospects what are they called? That's right, Fairweather fans. Now, if the Browns are doing well, they are Browns fans. If they are doing terrible, they get off that train or bus and they follow someone else. Their loyalty is just based on circumstances. And I just want to punch them right in the face. Take that terrible towel and flush it down the toilet. If you're a Pittsburgh fan, sorry, not sorry. Now, back to reality. Think of how this sometimes relates to our faith. If things are going well and it seems God is blessing us, it's easy to have faith. Some would call that circumstantial faith. Have you ever felt closer to God when things went the way you thought they should go? Has your faith ever wavered depending on your circumstances? For instance, if I get that job, and I know God is with me, so I love him. If I get an A on the test or my test comes back negative, then I have no problem believing in God. We've heard amazing stories of answered prayer, friends that are healed. The check comes in the mail. In our younger years, it was more like, whew, I didn't get caught speeding. The cop didn't pull me over. She said yes. A fish bites an empty hook. These circumstances seem to strengthen our faith. Wait a minute. Did I just say a fish bites an empty hook? The summer before my freshman year in college, I became frustrated with things in my life. One might say I was at a, a low. My parents had been fighting more than usual, and I lacked confidence in handling life. I thought everything I had been taught was based on feelings and emotions. So, I went out to a local lake where there was a pavilion and decided to go through Proverbs and pray for guidance. I wanted God's guidance. I wanted to write a moral code, kind of create a standard from which to live based on strong wisdom. I was tired of how living on emotion was causing our family to fail, and I needed truth or facts. I felt spiritually supercharged with spiritual clarity by the end of that week. I felt very close to God. And right before I left on the last day, I went out to the end of the dock and I decided to throw a hook in the water. I had a pole, I had a hook, but I did not have bait. And I just felt like I should give it a shot. I sat at the dock, 
moving the hook up and down as I prayed. After about 15 minutes of witnessing, bluegills swim up to the hook. They'd like look at it, shake their heads, and swim away. They would inspect it. It was clear they weren't going to take my imaginary bait. Now, after having a very great moment in prayer, something made me think to ask God to make the fish bite the hook. So I said, God, make me a fisher of fish. Now, I know that is a very nerdy and over-spiritualized way to say, God, make a fish bite my hook, whatever. With no bait, suddenly, a fish immediately attacked my hook. And less than a second after I said the word fish, I about fell off the dock into the water and couldn't believe what happened. I felt like I was part of a New Testament miracle. At that time, that miracle made me feel like God was guiding me and that he was with me. What other supernatural things could I do then? So I decided to try walking on water. As you could guess, that didn't go so well. Just kidding, I didn't really do that. Looking back, I believe God either knew the fish would bite my hook and that the Holy Spirit moved me to pray that prayer, or he made the fish bite the hook. It sure gave me a boost in confidence. My circumstance did increase my faith. Now, I don't want to discount the power of circumstances. I know God uses events to strengthen our faith. I remember even singing a song that Bill Gaither wrote back in the 80s about anticipating the inevitable supernatural intervention of God, or I expect a miracle. That's okay. We just, want, we just don't want those events to be the foundation of our faith. You see, there have been plenty of circumstances in life that have occurred, circumstances involving pain, sadness, and hardship that might have made me interpret God's presence in my life very differently. Maybe God hasn't always been there for you as you hoped. Maybe he answered your prayer with a no instead of a yes. Maybe he allowed a tragedy to infiltrate your life. He was silent when you needed direction. He didn't provide any discernible help when you needed it. And you have been tempted to give up on your faith. But what do you do when our prayers aren't answered? The miracle doesn't happen and our expectations go unmet. What happens to our faith then? Do we give up? Faith, faith based on whether or not our expectations are met is called circumstantial faith. Circumstantial faith alone is weak and can make us more susceptible to giving up. However, faith grounded in truth will help us stand firm at any moment. Do your circumstances impact your faith? The truth will sustain us circumstantial faith will leave us tossed in the wind. With Christ, we always have a great truth to fall back on. Paul dedicated one of the longest chapters in the New Testament to it, 1 Corinthians 15. The subject of that chapter is the resurrection of our bodies into glory. When everything else in our life seems disappointing and woeful, this truth never changes for us. Our resurrection into an eternity of grandeur and splendor is assured. Now listen to what Paul wrote to encourage us. This is several scriptures from 1 Corinthians 15, 22, verses 37 through 38, 42 through 44, 54, 57. I'll, I'll read them right now. For as in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all will be made alive. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives it its own body. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, 
then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. But thanks be to God. With, he gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul began verse 58 with a very important word. The word, therefore. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Therefore, it doesn't sound like much of a word, does it? But it is. It's a transition word. It links the great truths he had previously cited with a great conclusion that he is about to share. Here it is. He wrote, since all this is true, therefore, do not give up. Look at all the do not give up messages in this first. I mean, there's stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. You know, which is different than you feel, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, let's look at those words you know. You know are key to applying the truths of this chapter. They are faith words. The Corinthians knew these truths by faith. Faith is a conviction. It's not a feeling. Faith is a knowing without tangible pr proof. The word in the Greek means to see, but not necessarily see with our eyes. It is sometimes translated to understand or perceive. It means to know something by perception. For example, we read of Peter and John racing to the tomb of Jesus to investigate the wild claim of Mary that he had raised from the dead. Now, John 26 tells us that Peter saw when he looked into the empty tomb, but it is not the same Greek word that Paul used in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Peter saw with only his eyes. He did not perceive what had happened. John 28 tells us that he also saw when John went into the tomb. But the word used of him is the word Paul used in our text. He saw not just with his eyes, but he saw with his heart. He perceived what happened. That is why that verse ends by telling us he saw and he believed. We have a faith of understanding and perception. We know the truths of the resurrection of Jesus and our own future resurrection into eternal life. That is the foundation of our faith. Our foundation of faith is the same as the early Christians who knew nothing but that Christ was crucified and of his re resurrection. That is the reason the resurrection was preached in every sermon recorded in the book of Acts. The death and resurrection of Jesus are the central truths of our faith. Those two events changed the world and they changed the future for us because they change our future and they give us power over the present. Why would Paul spend an entire chapter making this connection for his readers? It's because at a low times in our life, when expectations are not met and our circumstances are terrible, we are easily defeated. We are tempted to give up, even on our faith. It's in those times we must lean upon what we know to be true. And it's in those times that our faith must be grounded in truth. Nothing is more true than the fact that God loves us. The reality of our suffering cannot diminish the truth of God's love for us. He loves us so much, he has built an eternal home in heaven for us. He loves us so much, he sent Jesus to pay the penalty of our sins so we can live in that eternal home. He loves us so much that he plans to change these corrupted, sin-infected, mortal bodies into glorious spiritual bodies which will live forever in that heaven with him so do not give up on that faith when everything else is taken from us it will be all we have left and it is enough it reminds us that while we might feel terribly defeated we are actually the most victorious people in the world nothing can really defeat us 
not even death. John the apostle later said it this way in 1 John 5, 4. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. As we focus on Jesus this week, we remember his sacrifice for our salvation. May we remember our faith is based not upon whether or not God answers our prayers the way we think they should be answered, but upon the truth that a man who died on the cross and came back to life. Is it bad to expect miracles? Certainly not. We are told he can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. And he has through Jesus. It is bad to base our faith on whether or not our expectations are met. Our faith has nothing to do with our needs or miracles on our behalf. The foundation of our faith is a man who predicted his own death and resurrection and pulled it off. This moment is about an amazing miracle that set us free. This moment is what drove the growth of the early church before the Bible existed and through intense persecution. Our faith has nothing to do with our circumstances. May we stay here in this moment when our circumstances want to make us doubt. Well, that's the end. You all made it. You hung in there with me. The substitute speaker. The epitome of unmet expectations. <laughs> Thank you for being so understanding and not bolting for the door in spite of those unmet expectations. One more thing. This is a message from Pastor Rick. This is directly quoted from him. He said, I want you to have a victorious faith, a faith that sustains you through the worst of times. It is already yours. Cling to it. Depend upon it. Use it to give you strength. Call upon it when your reserves are depleted. Just do not give up. <laughs>